80 years ago, on a remote island north of Hokkaido, a young boy helped his father collect tiny spruce trees to take back home to their nursery in Tokyo. The boy saw many of these tender saplings die, but his father never gave up. They made the treacherous journey across rough seas again and again just to cultivate Ezo spruce as bonsai. Tutored in passion and dedication, and instilled with discipline and patience, is it any surprise the young boy blossomed into one of the most renowned and revered bonsai masters? Although trees, uh, you know, don't move around, they don't talk back. They are very uh, expressive of uh, human uh, feelings and relations. Saburo was born in the spring of 1915, the eldest son of Tomekichi Kato II. Tomekichi was heir to the most prestigious of all bonsai nurseries in Japan, called Mansei-en, located in the town of Omiya. In the 1930s, when these bonsai were purchased to adorn the imperial palace, Mansei-en embarked on the cultivation of large forest-style plantings. These miniature forests would make Mansei-en famous for the next five generations. Tomekichi died soon after World War II ended. Mansei-en survived in post-war Japan in part because U.S. occupation forces became fascinated with bonsai and purchased their trees. Recognizing the potential to transcend language and national borders with bonsai, Saburo Kato teamed up with other bonsai enthusiasts and businessmen. Together, they promoted it as an art form, an industry, and most importantly, as a symbol of Japan. He helped uh, establish the Japanese Bonsai Growers Association, get it formal recognition by the, the government. One association he was involved with was primarily for the growers, professional growers, but then they organized the Nippon Bonsai Association, or NBA, as a mechanism for amateurs. Trees from Mansei-en found their way all over the globe. Bonsai clubs and organizations emerged. Saburo Kato inspired the creation of the World Bonsai Friendship Federation. We had an idea that through the love of the traditional art of bonsai, we could promote friendship and understanding regardless of our nationality. They staged a number of major exhibits and conventions. They published a, a series of wonderful books. He teamed up with another emerging icon, John Naka, to make love of bonsai a global phenomenon. Soon, trees were being presented as gifts to heads of state. President Clinton was going to Japan for an official state visit. Mr. Kato learned about this and sent me a, a fax saying that we would like to present uh, two bonsai to President Clinton. The beautiful upright Aso spruce had been collected by Mr. Kato and his father on Kanashiri Island. Bonsai came to symbolize the culture of a nation, and Kato-sensei, one of its most visible ambassadors. He believed that the deeply spiritual philosophy of Shibui, or beyond beauty, was at the core of Bonsai's universality. The spirit of Bonsai can create understanding and establish a world where, through a love of nature, people can live in calm and happiness. Over the past five decades, bonsai has become part of the lexicon, regardless of culture, because it speaks to the soul, embodies inner peace, and celebrates outward tranquility. 
growing up a young boy riding rough seas, to one of Bonsai's most prolific ambassadors. Saburo Kato lived the art form he championed, intertwining nature, man, the elements, and change into meditation and expression. He taught the world that love of bonsai was as much about aesthetics as it was about fortitude, commitment, patience, and life itself. It's a tree less than 24 inches tall, yet it imparts a sense of time and place. A good bonsai feels entirely natural, looks untouched by a human hand, and every element of it seems almost inevitable. Nobody did it better than John Naka. You're just putting your whole effort and your whole knowledge, whole techniques in your creating, you know. So that's where they, uh, all of this uh, person's uh, personality is uh, uh, reflected on a bonsai, you see. His love for bonsai began watching his grandfather trim and shape trees in their ancestral home on the island of Kyushu. His father had moved the family there from Colorado when John was eight. John did not just learn the relationship of trees, stones, and space that defines bonsai from his grandfather, but an irrepressible zest for life. In 1935, John returned to Colorado where he met and married his wife, Alice. They started a family. On snowy days, he would sit in front of the window and sketch trees. When World War II ended, John moved to Los Angeles and landscaped for a living. It's uh, much warmer than Colorado. <laughs> well, I felt that uh, I can do a lot of things more uh, in California than uh, Colorado. In Los Angeles, he resumed his love affair with bonsai. In a short time, he was teaching. First, close friends, then classes to broader audiences. John Naka was the most influential person uh, in the Western world since the uh, end of the World War II, and one of the first people to begin to teach non-Japanese the art and science of bonsai. But he also had an amazing ability to reach out to people. John had this remarkable knack. He was a showman, as well as an artist. John's charming and fun personality, combined with his keen knowledge of the art of bonsai, quickly garnered attention. His trees won garden shows, and his reputation as a teacher grew far and wide. He founded clubs and associations and wrote two definitive books on bonsai technique. He became one of the most influential figures in elevating bonsai from a novelty to an art. A bonsai is uh, just a, a different media. See, oil painting, well, I use the oil paint. But uh, bonsai is, uh, uh, I'm using a, a living tree, placing an oil paint. John was the first to teach bonsai in English. He traveled the world, demonstrating how native plants in any country can be adapted to bonsai, stripping away the myths and making it accessible to all. He brought with him not just his incredible knowledge, but a lovable wit and infectious vitality that made him truly a great ambassador. He joined forces with Saburo Kato of Japan to lead the World Bonsai Friendship Federation. The two bonsai giants shared a lifelong friendship and partnership. So you were Mr. Kato's bonsai bridge to the outside. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, uh, in a way, I guess uh, I was a bridge. Yeah. Without the bridge, he couldn't get there. That's right. Yeah. Well, I was honored that he depended on me. <laughs> there isn't an award he hasn't won, an honor he hasn't garnered. 
perhaps the most important, was bestowed by the U.S. National Arboretum, which discarded a long-standing tradition of naming buildings posthumously and dedicated a pavilion in his name. As you walk into the entrance of the North American Pavilion, there's his Goshen, a guardian of the spirit, his probably the most famous bonsai produced in North America, there to greet people. And then to the right is a bust of John Maka. We also have in the National Bonsai and Punjing Museum a collection of John's original art. So we hope that we can serve as an archive for memorabilia concerning uh, John Maka. Uh, for pe so people can come, study, and learn, see his work, and learn about uh, this very famous Japanese-American. Today, we are celebrating the life of a man who not only excelled as an artist and inspired as a teacher, but created a culture of understanding through his love for bonsai. <laughs>